Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless. The other day I was watching a live stream of Monsignor Rossetti on the Mission of God Catholic channel and I was really touched by what he did during this interview. Earlier in the interview, Jonathan told Monsignor Rossetti that he used to dabble with the occult during his younger years, but take a look at what Monsignor Rossetti did here, and this is why I love and respect this exorcist so much. Enthused with grace. Oh yeah. Again, every time I go to confession, I just feel renewed. If I'm if I'm just feeling like I'm in the mud and I know the devils are trying to work at me, like they're looking at my mission here too with Miss Day and a lot of the things I'm doing as a Catholic school teacher, I know they're trying to yeah. you know, slow me down in certain ways. You said uh, that uh, you did a little bit of this sort of uh, magic occult stuff in the past. Yeah. Before. Is that true? Yes, yes. Have you been prayed over? In, in regard, when you say when I've been prayed over, like have I gone to the um, to a priest to have like? Have yeah, it okay, done? I'm gonna say a little prayer over you. Oh, okay. th thank you. Please do over you and all those who are listening. Yes, I pray that the Blessed Mother will spread her mantle over you, Jonathan, and all those listening. I pray that the holy angels surround you and your lives and your loved ones, your possessions. May the blood of Jesus wash over you, Jonathan, and all those listening. May the blood of Jesus wash over you and cleanse you. May the blood of Jesus wash over you and cleanse you. May the blood of Jesus wash over you and cleanse you. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Thank amen. You, Thank you, Father. No, it's always necessary, yeah. Believe yeah. me, some of the stuff in the past has been in the past. <laughs> Well, Satan doesn't forget. I mean, he will say, well, I confess the sins, they're gone. Sure, they're gone. But yeah. the, the Catholic notion of this is, is this. And this, the Protestants don't, don't. Uh, I don't think they they quite grasp this Catholic notion, is that, yes, your sins are forgiven, but there, there needs to be a bit of a purification process, which is why you're given a penance. It's supposed to be part of your purification uh, and why we say if you're not fully purified, you're, you don't you go to purgatory first. Hi, thanks for tuning in to another video on Armor of God. As always, let me start by saying thank you so much for taking the time to watch our videos, for your continuous support of our works, and hopefully you'll always learn something useful for your own spiritual warfare while you're here. Well, for this video, I'm going to share eight important things shared by the late Father Gabriel Morth in regards to spiritual warfare, and I must say, just by looking at the comments, I'm really happy that a lot of you have been quoting what Father Amorth and Father Vincent Lampert said about the devil, and that is his greatest deception is to make the world think he doesn't exist. And I hope we can continue to expose this ancient serpent and pray for the people who are still looking for God in their lives. Now I'm going to include some random but useful audio clips as we go through the lists in this video. This way, we can listen to more useful things shared by other exorcists, and I hope you don't mind we're doing it this way. But I always appreciate any good or bad feedback if you have any, so please don't hesitate to let me know. Well, let's start with the first on the list now then. Remember, I'll be including random clips as we go through this list, so my apology in advance if you feel annoyed by this arrangement. Number 1. Pride, Money, and Lust According to Father Gabriello Morth, the most frequent weak points in man are always the same, pride, money, and lust. And it's important to remember that there are no age limits for sinning. He once wrote that temptations will end only five minutes after they have exhaled their last breath. And so we must not presume or hope that at an advanced age we shall be exempt from sin. A vice that is cultivated in youth will not lessen in old age without some work and intervention. For example, it's not uncommon for the elderly to confess to looking at pornography more often than the youth. The will to struggle against sin must be cultivated even to the end of our days. Number 2. Should we be afraid of the devil or the devil afraid of us? I like what Father Amorth wrote in response to this question. And he said, The demon keeps his distance from the one who nurtures his faith, who frequents the sacraments, and who wishes to live devoutly. And the reason for this is because the devil hates God and is in terror of him and anything that even has the odor of sanctity. If we think about it, we can recall periods of our existence in which we have intensified our interior life and felt stronger in resisting temptations. On the other hand, we must avoid becoming arrogant and must always remember that the demon does not ever cease to tempt us, even to the end of our days. But Father Amorth also reminded us that the devil can still greatly disturb a person who nurtures his faith, but he does so unwillingly because he is forced to by the power of a spell. He prefers, far and away, to be involved with those who have distanced themselves from God. In these circumstances, he is freer to act. What we have to remember is this. 
The devil is aware that he is stronger and more intelligent than we are, but he also knows that we are not alone in the struggle against him. Father Amorph provided an example regarding this. Don Bosco, one of the greatest saints of the 19th century, liberated a girl from possession simply by entering the chapel dressed in sacred vestments to celebrate Mass. And the reason for this? Well, the devil is in fear of the saints and their sanctity. Why do you think the devil hates the Virgin Mary so much? Some of you think that just because these exorcists are saying the Virgin Mary is so powerful during exorcisms is because of some power she has, or the other saints have. But the truth is it's her humility and obedience towards God that makes her so effective. So hopefully there's no confusion for this anymore, at least for those who are watching this video. I want to give you a picture of something fascinating that puts in that puts what what is happening in society today in a context our society western society is once again embracing paganism and i want to give you an account by pope cornelius who reigned from the year 251 to 253 he wrote a letter to fabius uh, the bishop of of antioch he identified so in other words putting this into context this is when the church is growing. The year is 251. Uh, the church is growing in the midst of paganism. It's growing mm -hmm. out of paganism. Christ has come into the world. Mm -hmm. He's been crucified, died. He appointed 12 apostles. Uh, those apostles then, uh, they, they are the pillars of the church and they yep. set in place the activity of the church. We're now in year 251. Christianity is still illegal in the empire. And Pope Cornelius writes to Fabius, and he identifies the Church of Rome as having 46 priests, seven deacons, but 52 exorcists. 46 priests, but 52 exorcists. So the number wow. of exorcists outnumbered those who offered Mass on Sundays. And this, is, this was necessary. This was needed. Because the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God, is being is born out of a conquering, a pillaging of the kingdom of Satan. That's what our Lord came to do. He didn't come to build a kingdom out of a vacuum. He came to pillage what the devil had accumulated. And so if we are rejecting, for one to reject being a member of the kingdom of God, inaugurated and instituted by Jesus Christ, by definition, one is a member of the kingdom of darkness because yeah. it, is, it is not possible to be neutral in this interaction, in this realm. You belong in one camp or by default to the other. Number three, do diabolical possessions and other spiritual evils exclude the presence of the Holy Spirit? Now, some of you said in the comments that a baptized Christian cannot experience diabolical possession because there's presence of the Holy Spirit. According to Father Amorth, we cannot reason in a human way with spirits. The represented space within the human body is not empty or refillable the way that a glass can be refilled by and empty of water. In the case of the demon and the Holy Spirit, the two rival entities can live together but obviously in conflict in the same person. On the other hand, we know that many saints were possessed by bad spirits. Even if evidently they were filled with the Holy Spirit. How does one explain this if the demon does not occupy physical space? Certainly the Holy Spirit can chase away the demon, but the Holy Spirit does it within the boundaries of our own free will, thus permitting us to make our own choices. And in the, the Gospel of Mark says, This kind of demon cannot be driven out by anything but prayer and fasting. Mark 9 verse 29. The demon always tries to hide himself because he knows that as soon as his presence is obvious to the outside world, it could be the beginning of his end. The person would then begin to pray more intensely, to submit to exorcisms and prayers of deliverance, to intensify his participation at the mass and so on. Beyond a certain limit, the devil is not able to resist the power of prayer and fasting. Obviously, this is not always the case, so it probably occurs through a mysterious divine permission or through the exceptional efficacy of the completed rite. But more often the demon is deeply ingrained and difficult to uproot, and exorcisms may continue for years and years. Number four, how does the devil appear or what does he look like? Well, firstly, we have to remember that the devil is a pure spirit, and so he does not have corporeal substance. Therefore, he is not representative to us in a fully comprehensible form. It is the same for him as for the angels. If they wish to appear to men, they must assume characteristics accessible to us. 
In his essence, he is much uglier than we can even vaguely imagine, and his horrific appearance is a direct consequence of his distancing himself from God and of his explicit and irrevocable choice of rebellion. This we can infer from logical reasoning. If God is infinitely beautiful, whoever decides to distance himself from God must be the exact opposite. But Father Amorth added that the devil, being very shrewd, can also assume innocuous forms. The case of St. Padre Pio is exemplary. At times the devil showed himself to him as a ferocious dog, at other times as Jesus or as the Virgin Mary, at still other times as his confessor or as the father guardian of his convent who commanded him to do something. But after verifying the order he received with his superior, he understood that he had had a vision of the devil. There were even a few times when the devil appeared as a beautiful naked girl. The demon could present himself with unpleasant odors, such as sulfur or animal excrement, and this usually happens at times when one is blessing a house or to persons particularly sensitive with odious noises, such as a clearly perceived rustling of the wind or harassing tactile sensations. Because that's actually become a very common question when people reach out to me that they're experiencing that, that they wake up in the middle of the night and they feel like they're in the presence of a demon and they're literally frozen. They can't move at all that somehow the demonic is preventing them from any form of mobility. I always say to people when they believe that's happening, the best thing to do is to uh, cry out in prayer. You know, you invoke the, uh, the Holy Spirit to come and be with you. And usually when people do that, the paralysis simply ends. I think paralysis is, is a way that the demonic tries to... Uh, lay hold of its victim, if you will, as a way of trying to take control. But again, we always have the capacity to cry out in prayer, to invoke the Holy Spirit, and whenever we do that, the demonic will flee. I always want to remind people that wherever the Holy Spirit is present, an unclean spirit cannot remain. Number five, the powers the devil gives to his devotees. One might wonder what powers the devil gives to his devotees along with the indecipherable sufferings. Some powers are clearly of a diabolical origin, while others require some discernment. Typical powers that are the direct consequence of the sale of one's soul to the devil are riches, free sex, and unlimited power. But remember this, at the beginning everything comes easily and seems to be a great and beautiful affair. However, all of it involves false illusions. Not long afterward, indescribable sufferings take over, signs that the devil has taken them for a ride because his objective is to make you a slave and ruin your life. Father Amorth shared a case in one of his writings, that of a young woman who had accepted the offer of consecrating herself to the devil in exchange for a luminous career. Soon afterward, she scaled the heights of her company, earning an impressive salary and a high social reputation. The devil had maintained his promise. But in exchange, he truly asked for her soul. She found herself living with intense moments of hatred towards certain individuals that were so strong and sudden that each time she would have to shut herself in the bathroom, beating her fists and her head against the wall and screaming with pain. She bitterly repented it, and only after a long journey which Father Amorth made with her did she manage to regain her liberty definitively, but the price was high. She had to give back the gifts given to her by the devil, and even before she had a chance to renounce her career, she was fired. But this time she was completely free, free from the devil. Number six, do the sins of our ancestors affect our life? Well, in regards to this question, Father Amorth provided a very interesting answer. According to him, there are those who maintain that the consequences of their ancestors' mediumism, and particularly some of their serious sins such as homicide, abortion, suicide, and magical practices are passed on to successive generations. However, among exorcists, there is no uniform position on the genealogical tree. Each exorcist develops a personal position based on his considerable experience. Father Amorth had some cases in which persons suffering demonic possession had ancestors who practiced magic and witchcraft. Moreover, he had discovered that a curse can be transmitted from one generation to the next, particularly if it is issued by a father or a mother against a son, his marriage, and his future children. For many years, Father Amorth followed a youth who was cursed in the womb by his father because he was unwanted and the father continued to curse him, so that when he was well into his adulthood, this unlucky youth had to deal with many misfortunes. But he later took good advantage of the blessings that he received from Father Amorth, as well as from other exorcists. An even more glaring case shared by Father Amorth was that of a young woman whose parents opposed her marriage to the young man of her choice. 
They cursed her on the very day of her marriage, wishing her the worst evils, and this was unfailingly accomplished. Only years of prayer alleviated the sorrows and the sufferings of this young family. Curses, which are wishes of evil, are extremely powerful, especially if they are made with real treachery by those who are related by varying degrees of kinship to the victim. But it's also important to remember that they can be conquered with blessings. Jesus said, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Luke 6 verse 28. In Father Amorth's view, there is not enough evidence to support the transgenerational thesis. Even Father Candio Amantini, Father Amorth's mentor in exorcisms, had serious doubts that sinful tendencies spread generationally. Their argument is this, would not the adherence to this hypothesis permit a person to abandon his sense of responsibility for his own life? However, even with this doubt, Father Amorth always advised the afflicted to make whatever sacrifices are necessary to break each evil spell. I was going to say, sometimes people that are sitting in the pews on Sunday, they say they're Christian, but then later on they leave. You know, I, I remember a, a pastor reaching out to me who said, I have people in my congregation, they're coming to services on Sunday, but then when they leave the church, they're walking across the street and going to have their palm read by the neighborhood psychic, and then didn't really see anything inconsistent with doing that. And oftentimes people might think, well, these things are just fun, they're entertaining, but in reality, they are contradictions to our faith. And, you know, we can't have it both ways. Directly when we do things, you know, tied to the new age, the occult, you know, things of an occult nature, whether we think they're fun and entertaining, so indirectly we open ourselves up to demonic influence, or directly when we know we shouldn't be doing these things, but we do them anyway. You know, Catholics would say that a psychic or a median doesn't have the abilities they claim to have. No one knows the future but God alone. Demons can use their intellect, you know, to make an educated guess. So the psychic either knows that it's the demonic working through them and they go along with it because they like the attention, the notoriety, the money they're making, or they've been duped by the evil working in and through them in believing that they have the power or the ability. I think it's so important for Christians basically to ask a very simple question. Is this practice that I'm doing consistent with my Christian beliefs? And if it isn't, we have to root it out. Number seven, the role of the angels in spiritual warfare. At the moment of our birth, divine providence assigns each of us a guardian angel with the specific task of protecting us, assisting us, and interceding for us so that at the end of life we can arrive at our destination, which is paradise. We have already seen that entire legions of angels have chosen the tragic road of rebellion against God. As a consequence of their choice, the devils radically changed their mission. Now, in fact, they use their superfine intelligence for the unique objective of destroying men and making them their companions in misfortune. As Revelation tells us, that gigantic war that was fought in the heavens among the angels and the demons has another battlefield here on earth. They are in a continuous battle for our lives and our hearts. From all this, one can affirm that the angels who remain faithful to God have a certain degree of power against ordinary temptations as well as extraordinary spiritual evils. And why is this? Well, Father Amorth puts it this way, because they are of the same nature as the devils, and they fight with the same spiritual arms. The angels intercede with God in favor of the one being tempted, and for this reason, the exorcists always invoke them during the prayers on the obsessed. That's why Father Amorth always said that it is good to invoke the angels often, even apart from their help with extraordinary spiritual evils. He always advised imploring their assistance. Our guardian angels have a special power of intercession with God, which is always the beginning of liberations from demons. The angels help, they intercede, but they themselves do not have the power to liberate the possessed from the terrible effects of demons. And any prophetic post-biblical revelation that claims that we ought to do this or that and in so doing, shifts our attention off that of the gospel theme, we must reject. Now, when I say shifts our attention off of the gospel theme, I'm talking about faith, hope, love. This is the centrality of the gospel message. It is not worry, fear, fright. And those messages that promote these themes 
are not to be followed. Now, the key word I use is theme. We can talk about these things. These things are mentioned in the Old and New Testaments, worry, fear, fright, but they are not themes of the gospel, nor the Old Testament, nor the New. And that's already a red flag when it comes to avoiding these pitfalls, these dangers. Some people refer to these, this, um, this triple triad of worry, fear, and fright as um, a deception, a distraction, a lure, a dupe from the evil one, and they are. They really are. Even though the psalmist says that fear is the beginning of wisdom, the fear that's mentioned in the Old Testament, which is a Hebrew word, does not translate into our English word, fear. Just like the gift of the Holy Spirit, fear, is not translated as fear in the English word, but rather as a holy respect. So we are not to entertain or make themes of fear as the guiding or motive force of our Christian journey, because love can never emerge from fear alone, cannot. Jesus says in Luke's gospel, when he was approaching a scene of people wailing, when he went to raise this deceased individual, fear is useless. What is needed is trust. His words verbatim, fear is useless. So if fear is good, then why would Jesus say it's useless? It's because we understand the word fear as a gift from the Holy Spirit and as the beginning of wisdom in terms of the English word fear, which is a false rendering of the actual Hebrew or Aramaic word, which is really holy respect. The true fear that's praised in the Bible is not to be understood as fright or worry or the human English word fear, but rather a holy respect which is similar to a child who does not wish to let down the high hopes, anticipations, expectations of its parent. So what does the child do? Out of wanting to fulfill the parent's hopes and expectations, avoids that which would um, dash their hopes and expectations, namely disobey the commandments of God, the desires of the parents. That is the fear in the scripture. It's not the sort of, it's the end of the world, let's hunker down and save our own skin kind of approach. Because that is counter biblical. Jesus says, he who wishes to save his life will lose it. And he who wishes to lose his life will save it. So when it comes to these revelations that speak of, as you mentioned, um, preparing ourselves for the worst, we have to look first to the gospel and compare these writings with the gospel theme, the centrality of the gospel theme, which is God's mercy, God's love, which never ends ever, not even for the souls in hell. The souls in hell God does not put there. <laughs> and this is something people don't understand. People don't go to hell against their will. God is willing to the very last breath. And according to St. Faustina's diary, even after their last breath, to save them. He, in Faustina's diary of divine mercy, diary in the soul it's called, she had a vision where after the soul dies, it's given an opportunity to be lost or saved. After it dies, it's given a vision of two doors. One leads to heaven and the other leads to hell and the soul will choose which door. God will not send the soul to hell. The question therefore is, well, why on earth? Well, now it's no longer earth, it's in the next life. Why in the next life would a soul want to even go to hell if they're given that free choice? Well, this is where the devil is very active. Like in the case of Judas Iscariot, the devil will convince the person, in this case, Judas, that all hope is lost. Now we can listen to the devil, or ignore his voice. Now, according to St. Bernardine of Siena, her church father, souls that have lived their life steeped in selfishness, ignorance, um, invincible ignorance, mm -hmm. selfishness, um, sin, 
will have a more difficult time choosing the voice of God at, at the moment of death over the voice of Satan because they have habitually listened to the voice of Satan and are used to this voice and follow his voice. So if not for a special grace, they will, they, their salvation will be difficult, according to Bernardino Siena. Now, what is the special grace? These are the graces, or this is the grace obtained from souls that pray for those who have no hope, like cloistered nuns and monks and religious people in the world sacrificing themselves for souls that no one prays for. And this is also found in the message of Fatima when Our Lady opened the earth and showed the three shepherd children hell along with people in it. And she said, many people are going to hell because there are not enough people to pray for them. So this is, all the, this is the grace, the special grace that these souls require to be saved who cannot save themselves by their own merits or deeds. And if there are not enough souls praying for them, they will not be saved most likely. This theme of the gospel, love and mercy, we must look at whenever we're reading these end time apocalyptic messages that don't make love and mercy the central theme. Number eight, Gloria Polo, the vision of hell. Well, I've decided to share what Father Amorth wrote about hell here for the last part of this list in this video because I feel it's a good reminder for us all. After all, hell as we know is the state in which the demons and the condemned are distanced from the creator, the angels, and the saints in a permanent and eternal condition of damnation. Hell, after all, is self-exclusion from communion with God. Father Amorth shared in his book the testimony of Gloria Polo, a dentist from Colombia who lived an extraordinary experience that literally agitated her life. On May 5, 1995, Gloria was struck by lightning. Just to give you a little background, Gloria was a lukewarm Catholic, critical of the church, a supporter of euthanasia, very dedicated to the care of her body, and interested in the new age. She did not disdain frequenting sorcerers and fortune tellers in order to have them predict her future. So anyway, according to Father Amorth, after Gloria was struck by lightning, her body remained lifeless for several minutes in cardiac arrest. During that time, Gloria had a near-death experience. She found herself in a tunnel with a bright light at the end, in which she met her deceased parents. It was paradise. But at the same time, she had strong feelings of guilt for the slight faith she had practiced during her life that was impeding her from remaining in that light. She then fell into a deep abyss. Many demons began to run after her, trying to capture her. She related how she had to run through many tunnels that kept getting lower and lower and were organized like beehives filled with people who were crying and gnashing their teeth with terrifying screams. Some of these were suicides. Gloria was convinced that she found herself in a place of spiritual death and eternal condemnation, with no return and no hope. It was hell. Only the intervention of St. Michael, who had grabbed her by the feet and brought her back up, prevented her from precipitating definitively. Here's how Gloria speaks of it in her own words. It was a terrible and truly painful moment. When I arrived there, the light that still remained in my spirit bothered those demons. All the horrifying unclean beings that lived there immediately began attacking me. Brothers and sisters, they are living a gloom and hatred that burns and devours and lays bare. There are no words to describe that horror. Being in the kingdom of hate, Dan's souls are subjected to the torment of the demons and to the sufferings they reciprocally inflict on one another. As Father Amorth have said many times before, in the course of exorcisms, there is a hierarchy of demons, just as there is with angels. More than once Father Amorth had found himself involved with demons who were possessing a person and who demonstrated a terror toward their leaders. One day, after having done many exorcisms on a poor woman, Father Amorth asked the minor demon who was possessing the woman, Why don't you go away? And the demon replied, Because if I go away from here, my leader will punish me. There exists in hell a subjugation dictated by terror and hatred. This is the abysmal contrast with paradise, the place where everyone loves one another and where, if a soul sees someone holier, that soul is immensely happy because of the benefit it receives from the happiness of another. You keep finding yourself saying, if I just get this one last thing, I'll be happy. I'll be done. You guys, I can testify to the fact you will never be done. You will never be done. And the fact is, is that the more you do that, the more that, that hole in your heart that is created for an infinite God is going to get deeper and deeper and deeper, and you're going to get more and more and more empty. I can tell you this from my own life. I haven't always been a priest. 
It might, might be hard to believe, but I haven't always been a priest. I made a lot of terrible decisions, a lot of stupid decisions. And I finally came to the understanding, finite things are not enough. And if we don't have the infinite desire, if we, we, should, have all, we should all have great desires to, to start companies and to do it for Jesus. And to, but your ultimate desire has to be for God. And when it's there, when that's at the height, when that's the pinnacle, that's in your hierarchy, and that's where it's, it's stationed, and it, it's the non-negotiable, everything else makes sense. That's why St. Augustine said, he said, love God, and then do whatever you want. Because there, there's no more law. If you love God, you're never going to hurt him. And now you've experienced freedom, true freedom, where you don't wake up the next morning and just feel like garbage or be like, what did I do last night? What did I say last night? What do I have to regret this morning? And then have that emptiness and say, now I got to go fill it again tonight. Well then, that is all for this video this time. I hope what I've put together for you in this video are helpful for your own spiritual warfare. If you have any suggestions about a certain someone or subject that I should cover, please don't hesitate to let me know down in the comments below. Anyway, I'd like to thank so many of you who have donated to help our works, especially covering the cost for subscriptions to footage from Motion Array, the music, and so on, and we're so thankful to your words of encouragement and advice from time to time. May God bless you. For any of you who'd like to support our works through donation, I've left a link to our PayPal donation down in the description box below, and we don't mind whatever amount you're willing to donate, and we can only repay your help and support by delivering more useful videos in the future. Well then that's all for this time. Until the next one, stay safe, stay healthy, and God bless you.